that we can go ahead and get started. Um, I know, thank you again, everybody, for joining us for Conservation Conversations for the month of February. We're going to be in love with bees. Um, this month, we thought it was a great theme, and we all, you know, love our pollinators as well. So Kate has a little bit of technical difficulties, so I'm going to see, do you want to try to explain what Conservation Conversations is? How glitchy am I? No? Okay, good. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I'm Kate Bremen. I'm the Director of Environment Maryland. Um, the quick intro, a lot of you have joined us before, but we have a ton of new people streaming in on Facebook Live and in the, in the Zoom. Basically, when quarantine and then the pandemic first started, Bridget and I got together and said, you know, how can we use this as, um, how can we create an opportunity for people to come together and serve two purposes? How can we bring people together with an opportunity to still connect and to be in a space where, where you feel like you're with other people? And also, how can we create a space where people can come and learn about conservation issues and conservation in a way that is joyful and is purely for the appreciation of, of nature and the natural world. So much of advocacy is there's this problem and it's really scary and we need you to care about it right now. Please sign this petition. And so conservation conversations was sort of born as this opportunity to just talk to people and to learn from people all across the country, which normally we wouldn't have had the access to do. So we're now in month 10 of it. And it has been the most incredible experience. So I am so excited for tonight's topic. I'm going to turn it back over to Bridget to give the intro of the topic and some of the, the housekeeping and technical details. All right. Thank you so much, Kate. So yes, my name is Bridget Sanderson, and I'm the director with Environment Missouri. And I am based out of very chilly Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we are also experiencing uh, the terrible winter weather right now. Um, but yes, so again, we want this to be a very interactive conversation. We will be discussing our love of bees with two wonderful guests. Um, so if you have questions throughout this discussion, if you're on the Zoom webinar, please put questions in the chat function or the Q&A function, we check both. And then if you are on the Facebook live stream, just comment your questions in the comment section. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our leader, Malia, who is our conservation advocate for Environment America. Um, Malia, do you kind of want to explain a little bit of the campaign that you are working on right now and then introduce our wonderful guests? Sure thing. Thanks, Bridget. So hi, everyone. My name is Malia Libby. Um, I'm calling out of Honolulu, Hawaii, where it's a nice warm winter here. Um, so I, I work on our Save the Bees campaign. So part of this work uh, focuses on promoting ways of helping bees. So that's through things like sustainable agriculture, as well as creating habitat for bees and banning the worst uses of pesticides that harm them. So I get to work with our state directors like Kate and Bridget on our bee projects in the states and some amazing partners like our panelists who are here today. So first uh, panelist that we have is Jess Tyler. So I'll introduce Jess. Uh, Jess is a staff scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity, where he works to protect pollinators and their habitat. Before joining the center, he worked on community science projects related to urban pollinators, urban forest canopy, and stream restoration. He has experience leading conservation work crews and in agriculture. Uh, he holds a master's degree in environmental science from Portland State University, and he lives and works in Portland, Oregon. Thanks for joining us, Jess. All right, yeah, thanks, Malia, and thanks, uh, Environment America, for having me. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, and I, I'm excited to talk about my work um, with the center um, to help protect uh, our, our native pollinators. Um, would you like me to just jump into my, to my little presentation now? OK, I All will. Right. Sharing. All right, um, am, I, am I sharing? Can you see my slide? Great. Um, uh, yeah, so I uh, am a staff scientist with the Center for Biological Diversity and uh, my organization 
I'm just going to jump right into our, our petition effort. Um, we worked with another group called the Bombus Pollinator Association of Law School Students of Albany Law School. They, they call themselves the Bee Pals. Uh, we together submitted a petition to list the American bumblebee, also known as Bombus pennsylvanicus, to uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to get it protected under the Endangered Species Act. Now, yeah, lots of you are familiar with the Endangered Species Act. It is um, our most important and powerful conservation tool to protect species. Um, and 99% um, of all species that have ever been listed have, have avoided extinction. So very few species that are ever listed um, actually go extinct. It's, it's super effective. And um, we're hoping that the American bumblebee will one day be protected. So the, uh, we chose the American bumblebee, which is uh, one species among uh, 46 bumblebee species that are present in, the, in North America. Um, we chose this bumblebee because, uh, it, because of its large range and also because of, uh, we've, because of its uh, incredible decline that has happened over the, the last about 20 years. Um, so the, I wanted to just start off by saying that yeah, this species is, is really quite impressive and just amazing in how adaptable it is. It um, has historically been found in 47 of the lower 48 states. It has probably, or like one of the largest ranges of any bumblebee in North America. Um, it's, it's highly adaptable. It uh, lives in the uh, deserts of the American Southwest and as far north as Maine and uh, Southern Ontario and South into Mexico. Um, yeah, it, it inhabits all open spaces and forages on a variety of, of flowering plants. Um, and, it, and it was one of the most, if not the most commonly observed bumblebee in North America. Um, however, like it's been um, over the last 20 years, uh, its abundance is down 90%, um, which is, is really devastating. And we uh, at the center decided to petition this species because um, just looking at, at the decline numbers, we just asked ourselves like if a bumblebee that is so common um, throughout the whole country, if it can be declining, like what's going wrong here? And we, we think that it really needs help. Um, and we hope that uh, the petition effort will uh, engage uh, more research to be done on the species and hopefully it'll be protected. Now, it, if the American is protected, it will join the rusty patched bumblebee as the only other bee in the lower 48 states that's currently on the dangerous species list. Um, this is a picture of the rusty patch bumblebee, very aptly named. Um, the rusty patch lives in the, in the upper Midwest and Northeast, uh, 27 states. It too has seen a really impressive <laughs> decline of 95% decline over in, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, and yeah, in, in general, the habitat loss, uh, increasing pesticide use, uh, disease and climate change have been the, some of the driving factors of the decline of, of uh, these two bumblebees. And importantly, it's this combination of multiple threats that's really led to their decline um, and what we write about in our petition. Um, some of the main threats in a little more detail, um, uh, habitat loss is the number one driver of insect decline. Um, we know that the, with increasing industrialization of agriculture over the last 50 or so years has really increased uh, agriculture's reliance on pesticides and other um, agrochemicals, as well as just like increasing the amount of, of land that's already farmed, which has decreased the amount of, of uh, flowers and, and habitat for, for lots of bees. Um, pesticide use in particular has really uh, increased, especially with the, the introduction of genetically engineered crops and the uh, relatively new family of pesticides called neonicotinoids which many of you have probably heard of. Um, over the last 20 or 30 years, the increase in neonicotinoid use has 
really increased in popularity, like huge increase. Um, and we don't think it's any coincidence that also in the last 20 to 30 years, these two bumblebees have also declined. Um, so e even at low doses, pesticide use, including fungicides, um, reduces, um, it just makes be bees less healthy and which makes them more susceptible to diseases, which um, can spread really quickly in uh, wild populations. Climate change additionally uh, is changing the, the bloom time of flowers, which uh, makes it harder for bees, especially in the springtime, to find the food that they need to start off their, um, their colonies. Now, many of you yeah, are, are listening to this webinar because you care about bees or you're interested in them. And, um, you know, I just told you about some of the threats facing them and, and they, they really are quite staggering and it, it feels really hard to, um, to really get anything to make anything happen with them. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think it really does start with sort of the theme of this, of this webinar is just to like, uh, yeah, increasing our appreciation for bees and, you know, showing bees some love. They, uh, I think it is just a really important thing um, because it, when, when we appreciate the more of our natural world, we're more likely to uh, protect it. Now, I fell in love with bees when I was in graduate school doing my research, my master's research on urban pollinators or pollinate the pollinator communities in urban agriculture in uh, Portland, Oregon. And while I was doing that, I, I took this picture on this slide and it's just my favorite picture because um, how can you not, like this bee is just so cute. And then it's just like peeking over this little ledge just so nicely. And it was um, it's just with its big eyes and its um, golden hairs. I think it's just awesome. And what my, um, my research and, and just like exploring bees more, I've always been impressed by just the, the sheer diversity of bees that are out there. There's more than 4,000 species in North America, uh, 46 bumblebees. Um, one of my favorite bee researchers um, explains that, uh, like, likes to say that bees are hippie wasps, if you want to explain just the different kinds of bees. And they're, hippie, they're hippies because they're long-haired and vegetarian. That's my joke for the day. <laughs> <laughs> the bees evolved from wasps uh, over a long period of time and the, their hairy bodies allow them to, the, the nectar and pollen to stick to them and so it, it helps the flowers with transferring pollen um, and, and the bees to, to eat the nectar as well. Um, but at, what I, but in general bees are very gentle creatures and over my uh, research project. I, I've never been stung by, I was never stung by a bee during my research project and it's really easy to observe bees. I would recommend it, you know, once it's not snowy anymore, you can go outside, find some flowers and uh, and just observe bees and you'll be pleasantly surprised at just the diff, all the varieties you'll find. Um, but people need bees and, and bees need people too. Unfortunately, a lot of the the threats facing bees are, are human caused. Um, but that also means that we can do something about it. Um, and so my, my last slide is just about some general stuff about what every everybody can do to help pollinators. Um, I have a list of there's eight things, eight topics here that are taken from a recent publication. Um, the top three of them are the most relevant for pollinators. Um, and in general, I think that the poster that I share on this slide uh, sums it up pretty well. Um, increasing our the floral diversity, um, having more flowers uh, brings in more bees. Um, and, and emphasizing native plants is really important uh, re and reducing pesticide use wherever we can. Um, reducing pesticide use is really important. Um, I know Environment America is working on neonicotinoids, um, a ban on Neonics like they have in Europe would be a, would go a really long way to helping uh, support our pollinators. Um, and additionally, uh, voting for politicians and policies that uh, support the Endangered Species Act and, and wildlife in general 
also really help. Um, I just want to want to wrap up by saying that uh, like this is I had this poster is uh, I, I wanted to share it because it's I have it framed and it's next to my it's on the wall over here and um, not only do I think it's just like pleasing to look at but um, I like it because it references um, posters that were made post World War II to to um, encourage people to plant victory gardens um, in order to uh, you know in uh, because of food shortages and to just get people to uh, be more self-reliant in a, in a time of hardship. And I think the situation that a lot of bees and a lot of pollinators face right now is, is similar. And we really uh, developing like a social movement to plant bee victory gardens for bees would be amazing. The only problem I have with this poster is that it only has honeybees on it and honeybees are of course a very important bee for agriculture and uh, in our food, um, but it's only there are only one species. There are domesticated species um, that are very reliant on humans. They're not they're not a wild species, and they're only one among thousands of of native species. And so I think what this poster really needs mm -hmm. is uh, Andrina and Megakaili and Bombus bumblebees, um, Serotina and Elictus and uh, this alder birch borer and bumblebees that look like flies that look like bumblebees and swallowtail butterflies that, and many more. Um, we need, uh, to do as much as we can to to preserve and help our native pollinators uh, survive and I hope that our, our petition effort can and do that and and uh, as well as um, any lots of other actions that everyday people can take. Um, that, that's all I got. Um, I'm happy to answer some questions about our petition and uh, what you can do for help pollinators. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, Jess. That was really great. I'm definitely gonna use that hippie joke later on. Um, and yeah, it's great to hear about the efforts to list the American bumblebee. And as you said, a lot of those threats that bees, like all species of bees face, both native and honeybees, um, they're reflective of a lot of our human activity. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm excited to introduce Matt. So a bit about Matt and his organization. So the good of the hive is an idea, a movement, an organization, and an adventure founded by artist Matt Wiley on a personal commitment to hand paint 50,000 honeybees. That's the number necessary for a healthy, thriving hive and doing that in murals around the world. So the mission is to ignite radical curiosity for planetary health issues uh, through art and storytelling. So the bee and her hive are the artist symbols, but at the essence, it is about activating and celebrating the power and human connection. So glad to have you, Matt. Thanks. Can you hear me OK? Good. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is like really great. I learned a ton from Jess. That was a great presentation. Thank you. I love like, like I come at this work not from the science end. Um, I come at it from an artist who was um, just normal mural painter, painting around the country, doing different projects, and then I got bit by the honeybee, not literally, but like the, the, I met one on the floor of my studio in New York City in 2008. And I had a similar experience to Jess, which was I got down on the floor and hung out with this little bee and was like, these things are adorable. Like how, I'm, I'm, I was like, I don't know, in my late thirties at the time. And I was like, how do I not like see these as the little tiny flying animals that they are? Like I, just hadn't until then and I I was blown away with the cuteness and the fuzziness and I just had this like connection with this one honeybee and um then you know she died I'll just go into the story a little bit for a second and I put her out in the backyard and I came back in and I started researching honeybees and back in 2008 the first thing I came across was colony collapse disorder which was this huge mystery back then millions of bees were dying all over the world and no one knew why. And I was literally in the middle of New York City thinking, how have I never even heard 
about this or seen one magazine cover or a newspaper article and it was like blown away by that. So I started looking further and I came across some behaviors of the honeybee that fascinated me. And um, like one of them was um, the behavior called altruistic suicide or altruistic self removal from the hive. And this is if a bee feels sick and it's in the hive, it will exit the hive and fly off into the abyss for the good of the hive, which is where the name of the organization came from about seven years later. And, um, you know, they take this drastic action because they are hardwired to understand that their immune system is collective. Now, like take the pandemic, what has it taught us about the connectedness of all of us? But in, the, in 2008, I was really blown away that the bees understood this. I was walking around New York City, seeing people on the subway. And after this experience that I had learned from nature, from the bee, I was like, I'm so much more connected to these people than I ever thought. You know, and that just sort of took me down this road of curiosity. And it was, you know, I had been wanting to do a mural um, to raise some awareness about what was going on with pollinators. And, um, and then someone <laughs> reached out, I'm being filmed right now because we're actually creating a television show and my videographer just nearly fell on his ass. That's John. Anyway, that's kind of hilarious. But um, so life in the real activist realm. Um, so we, uh, so after about um, a few years of just talking to friends about how fascinating bees were, someone called me up or sh sent me an iPhone video of the side of a honey company in LaBelle, Florida. And they said, you know what, Matt Willie, you should paint bees on this building. And I was like, you know what, I'm gonna call them up. And I just called them up and said, would you like a mural? And they said, we would love to have a mural. Um, we have no money to pay you. The town has no money and murals are illegal in the city of LaBelle. And, um, and I had moved to Asheville, North Carolina at that point, but I was like, you know what, you guys, if you guys can figure out how to get the law changed, don't think, don't worry about the money, I'll figure out a way to do this. And, um, I, you know, we had a nice conversation, hung up the phone, and um, I figured they would never call me back. But two months later, they called me up and said, we got the law changed, when are you coming? And... So I put up a little web page, called it The Good of the Hive. It was gonna be one mural um, to raise some awareness. And I, I, it raised like about $500 for gas money. So I hopped in my little Ford Ranger and I headed to Florida. And some amazing things happened when I got there. Someone put me up in their RV for free for 10 weeks. Restaurants in town started giving me free food. A uh, free salad bar, the coffee shop in town wouldn't let me pay for a cup of coffee. People started dropping off little beekeepers, like local beekeepers, hobbyists would drop off a little jar of honey and sit, telling me to sell it for, to raise money for the, the project. And, you know, then someone wrote an article and it hit Facebook and over the, you know, over the course of the project, it basically ended up getting completely funded by this collective effort. Even other honey companies around the country were sending donations for me to paint bees on what in my mind would be a competitor's wall. You know, so something interesting was happening with this. And um, I would turn around while I was painting, while I was also learning about bees from the beekeepers who lived there. I was around bees for literally the first time, live bees in my life, and was getting more and more fascinated by them, just by the beauty of them, but by also the energy of being around a lot of bees. It's a very specific feeling. You know, you really have to sort of check yourself. And like, I liked what they were showing me in the, in the sense of like, I hadn't seen these pieces of myself that I had to be aware of in their presence, you know, because we're so trained to be in fear of them that when we're walked into their presence and honor it and sort of look at it like something different than something to be scared of, I think that was one of the most powerful things about that project for me. You know, um, how was I looking at the environment different? How was I looking at my fellow people differently and leaning into connection as opposed to being scared of some things? And so the, um, and I would turn around on a project, that project, and I, I remember one specific time looking back and seeing like a totally tatted up, like 18 year old girl with a nose ring talking to this like 80 year old farmer. 
and they were just kind of nodding and like agreeing and looking at the bees and I was like something's happening here and um they did, then they made the the mural site a, a water stop on a ride for hungry kids going across Florida and um which was great and and we got to share about the bees and what was going on raise some awareness and the producer of that ride literally walked up to me with a bee perched on his shoulder like a pirate or something and a parrot and he says this bee is telling me to come and talk to you and i said what's the bee saying and we got into a conversation and he just flat out asked me how many bees were in a healthy hive it's just regular question and I had just learned between 30 and 60,000 was the average and so I told him that and he just said do you think you could paint 50,000 of them and I was like huh that was like the second lightning bolt moment with the behavior and then that literally was six how many years ago that was in 2015 and I've now painted over 6,000 individual bees and 30 murals from Southern California to the Smithsonian in DC to the UK and um, I've now got a whole my organization exists around it called the good of the hive which was a um, just an idea when I was doing that first mural it was just a phrase and now it's really about us you know we talk about um our like the human connectedness to nature and how much of that we've been losing with cell phones and cities and all of that and how like the the connection of the bee to her hive has really become my symbol for us to nature or us to our world so i talk a lot now when i paint a mural that i'm I'm not just painting bees on a wall, you know, the number is 50,000 that I'm going to get to. It's going to take about 15 to 20 years, but it's really us that I'm painting. And the idea is that we will continue, you know, the, the momentum of it and the connection around it and the joy and the enthusiasm and the beauty and the love and all of those things that nature offers us is where I'm leaning into with the work at this point. You know, um, my learning curve, really, I, I go along and through Instagram or um, Facebook or interviews or any of this, a lot of the time I share what I've learned along the way because I don't have a science background. I don't have a, a real, I didn't have some love of nature. I sort of grew up in the suburbs. We went skiing. We didn't even go camping when I was a kid, you know, but I've discovered this. The curiosity was sparked in me. Um, and so... I try and convey that when I'm talking to kids or adults, that that spark of curiosity for that that one bee gave me is like something to seek out because it's powerful. It really is a, a, a way of looking at your own life out in the world with connection and um, Anyway, so that's a big part of it. I wanted to, I don't want to talk too long, but I wanted to share a couple of videos. I'm currently, like I've got um, uh, murals lined up for the next couple of years, but we're also filming, I showed you John, and we're creating the first episode as we speak, which I'm really excited about. I'm a little bit tired because we've been talking and talking and talking about what we're going to do with this first episode, but it's going to talk about the origin story of how this all happened and what happens when I go to a mural site? Like, what do we do? We've done everything from throw a hip hop dance party on the top of a, you know, I put a rap artist up on a, the top of a community center and lit him up like Las Vegas and got people dancing to like um, just a million different things on different sites. We talk about activism, like what is art activism as opposed to the environmental end? Like how are we bringing people into connection with these ideas and the things that need to be done to change the world? And how do we do that with beauty and love and connection and all of those things? That's a big part of the job of the good of the hive, you know? Um, and I'm also looking at the hive as a, a much bigger than a honeybee hive. The whole thing is a metaphor for like trees, water systems, soil, people, you know? Um, everything that goes on within the metaphorical hive is what interests me right now because it is all connected um so i wanted to show a couple of videos it's really kind of boring to talk about making art for you know and then not show any so i thought we'd attempt to do a screen share 
and see if I can get this uh, in a minute. That's this one. It was about 10 years ago and I was in my studio in Manhattan. And I turned around and I saw this little tiny honeybee in the middle of the rug. And she was moving really slowly, so I had this opportunity to get down on the floor and really study this little bee and hang out with her. And in that time, it took about two and a half hours before she died, and I connected with her. I connected with the beauty of this little creature that I'd never noticed before. And it's really how this whole story began. Stop share. <laughs> I have a couple of other videos, but people can go to the good of the hive .com and check out other things if they want. I think that basically that one tells the, the story pretty clearly, um, paints the picture, as they say. Um, but uh, I also just the last thing I wanted to say before we go to questions and stuff is like, I love that you guys are doing this. Like, I love that we're having these con these conversations that, and I can't wait until they can be had in coffee shops all over the country and people can get together and actually meet and fall in love while they're talking about saving the world. You know, like, I think that's gonna be a thing. Like, I'm hoping that's a thing. And, um, but um, because that's really, I believe what what both Jess and I were talking about was like really, loving these creatures, really loving the nature that's around us, and then looking at it with real hope and possibility, you know? I think that's what pollinators actually offer us, because they're just doing what they do. They're going to keep doing what they do, but what we make of them and how we work with them is totally different in the way we look at this, but it's it's a lens, you know, like that anyone can can look through, you know, out in their yard. It's so easy, you know, and accessible. So anyway, that's all I've got. That was so fascinating from both of you. Um, we are going to have our question time now. So again, I'm just going to reiterate, if you are in the Zoom chat, please just put any questions in the chat function or the Q&A function. We read both. And then if you're on Facebook Live, um, just put it in the comment section on the, on the live stream video. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and have Malia start off with questions. Yeah, I'll start it off with a question for Jess. So you have some experience uh, working in community science projects. So I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that um, and who can get involved with that and how it helps pollinators. Sure, I love community science. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's great for yeah, education just generally, and you know, and the community science, you can generate really useful data to, to help understand the populations of pollinators. And I, when I did my my master's research, I I, I purposely uh, did it as a as sort of a community science effort. I got volunteers to help me um, do our, our counts and identify some of the bees in these these orchard the orchards that I that I went to, but. Um, yeah, there's there's tons there's a bunch out there of of opportunities if you if you want to learn more about bees and and contribute to to bee science. Um, I 
um, yeah, there, there's a, with the, with the rise of like and smartphone apps and uh, web-based uh, platforms, you can contribute to, to multiple ones. Um, the Xerxes Society has a really good one. Uh, it's called Bumblebee Watch. Um, that's specifically bumblebees, but um, there's a couple other ones. The Great Sunflower Project is one out of uh, California. Uh, Bee Spotter is another one that's sort of more in the Midwest. Um, and if, if you look, uh, there's more statewide efforts too. Um, there's, I know there's a, there's a Bumblebee Atlas programs in Oregon and Maine that I'm aware of anyway. Um, and you can, um, you can not know anything about bees and you, you can find some, some people to uh, help you identify them and, and hopefully uh, uh, more in-person learning about um, how, how to identify bees uh, will, will be a thing in the future and we can, we can do, uh, make more of that happen. Um, I'm hoping my audio is okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I have a question for Matt that, that got sent to me by a friend who's watching. And Matt, I just wanted to say first, while I was listening to your story, and you talked about the good of the hive and, and the kind of this huge community centric, um, just how hives are set up to be that way. And then you talked about going to Florida and how the community immediately came towards you and came around you and met your needs. And I was so struck by that connection of how you learned this about bees. And then you moved through the world with that knowledge and community came to, to meet you, to get your coffee, to get your food, to find you a place to stay. And it just made me think so much about how tapping into that wisdom from other species is like, can totally change the way we look at community in the world. So I just um, was really struck by that. But the question that I have is, is from a friend who's a musician. And the question is with, with all of the, you know, I'm an advocate, we're in policy. We talk a lot about this from that angle. You're an artist who's making a huge change and bringing people's awareness. The question is, what is your kind of top encouragement for artists who may have an interest in advocacy? Um, how do they get started? What's kind of your top advice for them if they wanna use their art to change the world in this way? Um, you mean existing artists that already like they want to be an artist or are they existing artists because like there's a difference when I'm like talking to young high school students and they're like interested in art and thinking about going to art school I'm all about fine like who's painting the rhinos I mean I'm sure there's people painting the rhinos but it works this idea it definitely brings attention when you make something big and giant on a wall and it's in somebody's community permanently they it gets in their brain and when you do it with beauty and love and not shock you know like my, i'm all about the especially if we're painting nature like i would say just begin like i did not have like a business plan to do this you know i've been like an artist all my life i sort of went from one project to one another project painting murals and then i sort of applied that to this and i thought okay who wants me to paint bees on the wall here's an idea you know and then i said okay who wants to help pay for that you know because this is my work this is my i value the the that artists should not starve, especially if they're out there doing this kind of work. And, you know, I was just talking with John about um, one of my favorite books is by, uh, this is one I would recommend that any um, young artist read. It's by Vasily Kandinsky and it's called Concerning the Spiritual in Art. You know, and he talks in the, even in the introduction by the translator, they talk about the, the social duties of artists and the importance of communicating, not just making art. I mean, there's room for all of us, but like there is definitely a need right now for communicating the stories of what we need to change in nature, about climate, about water, about, you know, frogs, whatever it is. But if one more person is out there doing it with passion, like, ah, oh, you know, like art is love made manifest. So if we're making art about it, it automatically connects to a love of nature, you know? And um, so I think that's really powerful for people, you know, as an artist, you can't really do something other than what you're called to do. That's the, we open up that channel and we do it and we follow it, but you can steer a little bit, 
you know? <laughs> so that would be my biggest piece of advice, you know? And tenacity, persevere, don't quit. You know, I mean, there's a million times I could have quit this and I didn't, you know, so. Yeah, I really, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go off on a tangent really fast. I do have a question though. <laughs> um, I just, I love how this conversation's kind of grown together, right? Because, you know, Jess, you were talking about citizen scientists and, you know, I was formerly a soil scientist up until this. And I think that a citizen science experiment that I did tagging monarch butterflies when I was in second grade really helped me fall in love with the passion of nature and being outside and everything and has now landed me here. So total side point, not the question. I just love how this has turned out. Um, I do have a question on Facebook and I try to keep track when they're happening, but I did miss this one. Um, and so Jess, this one is for you. And I think it was on the slide that you were talking about the different reasons why we're having a population decline in bees. And I believe that this was about uh, pesticide use. And the question is, can that cause genetic cross-generation problems? Um, I'm not sure if you understand that question, but is there, are there any issues with bees basically um, having cross-generation issues? That's a good question. Actually, I don't, I can't say that I specifically know um, any, any research about looking at genetic, um, you know, changes, but I, I, I do know that there are, um, yeah, pesticides cause a whole host of different uh, issues for bees, is, um, whether that's like impairing their, like, uh, their sleep and um, their susceptibility to disease um, the, um, or their their motivation to forage or um, yeah their, their reproductive output I'm the, the I I'm, I'm confident there are some genetic um, impacts for sure I, I can't I can't speak to that specifically though yeah I think the unknowns about pesticides are what makes them you know something that we should really look into a lot more and move away from eventually, uh, lessen our use of, just because, you know, they do affect the brains and their development. So there's a lot of scary things that go along with that. Um, I have a question for Matt. Um, so you talked a bit about how uh, you worked with beekeepers and um, you, you had bees around and you were able to get really close to them. So what are all of the ways that you went about studying bees for your art and your murals. Yeah, sure. The um, I actually had the the benefit of living in Asheville. Like interestingly, um, I found out that I had moved there before I started the Good of the Hive, and I literally had moved within one mile of Phyllis Stiles, who started Bee City USA, which is now a Xerxes. The um, Xerxes sort of absorbed them and is running. She's running it from there now. And so like, I was learning a ton there. The Center for Honeybee Research was, is in um, or around there. And I met all these people that had like bee sanctuaries in their backyard. Like, so Deborah Roberts um, of Holy Bee Press, she has like a quarter of a million bees and she just walked me through them, you know? Like, so I could like be with them in a way that I wouldn't have occurred to me to do. Like I was a person that showed me a lot of that. And, um, and I studied a lot of pictures. Sam Drogi is, uh, um, is one of my heroes, actually. I know him, we've spoken at a couple of events at Smithsonian and like, I got, I just Thank love him. He's a, he's a bee hero. Yeah, he's a total hero. Like if anyone out there has not gone down the rabbit hole of looking at Sam Drogi's photographs of bees, go, go now. And um, well, after this is over, <laughs> the, um, but that, like, I just started getting, anything you're fascinated with, it's easy, you know? I just started looking at them and I'm really getting into other pollinators now as well, like, and looking at, um, like, I was more interested in things, like when I did the Burt's Bees Global Headquarters, I really wanted to depict a swarm, like the idea of the swarm, this sort of healthy, you know, 
uh, move, you know, and really talk about that, this thing that can be so scary, you know, and at the National Zoo, I did painted the, the great ape house, but I was like, behaviors more, looking at like, the bees when they swarm was fascinating to me, this like cluster of them all, you know, and um, I just kept looking closer and closer. I mean, that's what an artist does. And then uh, there's a million pictures. People are great about taking pictures online. So I look there, people send them to me. And um, yeah, it, the love of them just keeps expanding for me. Like I'm built for it. So I kind of get more and more interested by things as I go along. Um, I'm looking forward to this year's, the way that it's gonna unfold this year's murals um, are gonna be a little different. So yeah, that answer your question. That's exciting. I'm now excited to see how they're gonna be different, I'm ready to find out. Um, the next question is in the Q and A on the chat and I'm gonna read it the way it was written, but then I'm also gonna expand upon it a little cause I actually want both of you to answer. So the question is, on a legislative level, what would be on your wish list for the improved protection of pollinators? The Endangered Species Act was mentioned, but looking forward, what do you see in addition to this act as necessary to recover pollinator populations and health? And so I think it probably just, you know, it might have been targeted to you um, looking at that legislative piece of like, what are you advocating for? But I also would love to hear Matt, you know, on the personal level from how your interactions have been with individual people and beekeepers, you know, what have you heard that maybe they have been advocating for and that they want to see in their communities change as well? So we've got this legislative piece and, and you know, how can we get that by engaging with community members? So either of you can take it first. Um. Should I go? And I'll let Jess bring it home. Um, yeah, I actually, it's funny you bring that up because I was just on the uh, Zoom day before yesterday with the NRDC. And last year, they launched the Birds and the Bees Protection Act. And we all met at Albany State Capitol in New York. Um, and a senator and a congressman were um, sponsoring this bill. And, you know, they, we were catching up because we all know the pandemic has thrown everybody like for a loop. But what I did was I did a three paneled piece and I called it the conversation piece, which would be interesting to like, I don't know, I just thought about the conservation conversations, maybe popping in with a picture of it here or there or something. Um, but it's really three panels um, that I, started there, but the idea was to keep painting different pollinators, different birds, different species, seeds, different things on it as we have this conversation continuing around this bill. And what's happened is more information has come out with Cornell, so they're rewriting this bill and it's to put a moratorium on the use of neonicotinoids for five years. That was the original one in New York State, which would be the first state in the United States to officially do that, which would mean they would be stopping the use while they study what's going on with neonics. And the new study actually speaks to the fact that the neonics are affecting us as well as the bees, which people have been ignoring. I think people knew it, they know it in Europe, they're just not saying it like so because it's everybody's so careful about everything. But they're rewriting the bill and that's the one that I'm going to be supporting like crazy. I'm going to be working on the piece and, and hopefully reconnecting with the senators to help, you know, really move it forward. That's where the art can help because I can pull with a visual um, rather than just a person talking. Sometimes you can get people to, hey, look over there, <laughs> you know, it's like you're just painting something. So that's what I'm going to be working on. But I think there was another part to your question. No. Okay. Yeah, that, that all sounds great, Matt. Um, yeah, the, it's, yeah, I want to echo that. Uh, yeah, uh, neonic legislation and changes are, are definitely at the top of the list. Um, uh, the center has def has been working really hard to uh, get changes to um, how EPA regulates um, neonics and pesticides in general, which doesn't. So uh, EPA has the ability to to just not register uh, certain pesticides. Uh, it could also be done at a legislative level. Um, whether that, whether that happens, I mean, we'll, we'll have to see. And there, yeah, there are some some promising things in the works. In the works. Um, 
Uh, I mean, also on the wish list, I, I think there, there should be more research and potentially regulations in how um, domesticated bumblebee colonies, honeybees are transported across state lines in order to uh, cut down on the disease spread from domesticated um, colonies to wild colonies. Um, that, that would be, that'd be on a wish list for sure. And, uh, but also just encouraging and funding, uh, I mean, even basic science and more research about bees. Uh, it's unfortunate that I mean, bumblebees are, are the, the best study, but that, like I said, there's 4,000 native species in North America, and we don't have very good information about them, unfortunately. And um, like, uh, for example, in, in Oregon, uh, yeah, many or several years ago, the the state uh, put in, a, had some really good legislation, put in a lot of funding to do bee research. And out of that came this uh, Oregon Bee Atlas project, which has been a, yeah, it's a, it's a community science project. I've contributed to it. Um, it's been people all around the state have contributed um, the observations of bees. And we've gotten just tons of information, new species to the state were found um, and just a better, if we can understand like how populations um, exist and change over time, we can really um, direct our efforts a lot better. Well, it's funny that you just ended on that because the next question is actually maybe for both of you as well. Um, so the question is, is the like collective nature of bees the reason why that 50,000 is like the sign of a healthy um, hive or is it just like, just based on population? I'm, it's, yeah. why is it 50,000? <laughs> uh, you're talking about the average number or the number I'm painting? Oh, well, you, you uh, were saying that 50,000 is the sign of a healthy hive, yeah. correct? Yeah, that was basically the average number someone told me. And I thought from a, you know, you can have 100,000 in a, in a bee colony and I think, uh, I'm not a beekeeper in that sense, but like when I talk to beekeepers, like, yeah, 50,000 is a pretty good, solid, healthy number. And it's also, I needed a number that wasn't random in a, in a sense. And I didn't want to go to the extreme of like, what's the most bees in a hive. And, um, and it just seemed like, you know, we were talking about this today, like we're in a time period of like the goals we have and we have to, to aim toward are audacious. Like what we're trying to create change around, whether it's fossil fuels, whether it's cleaning up the soil, whether it's the plastic in the ocean, whether it's pollinator health. I was like, I want to embody that audaciousness and do it with enthusiasm and passion and beauty and like an adventure. Like part of what I talk about a lot is like millennials and Gen Zers and that those age groups I'm not in. Um, I'm a Gen Xer, but like, gosh, there's so much weight on what they have to do, you know? And so me as someone who's, you know, building a business around this, I really want to offer a place where people could come and work that would be fulfilling and have a sense of purpose and we're, we're enjoying it. And it's not always a battle against the system. And then like, how can we partner with those people doing that really serious work and like lift them up a little. You know, I was at the, um, like th different things have come into focus for me over time. And in, I think it was 2016, I can't even remember now, it was the, it was at the uh, Planetary Health Alliance meeting in Edinburgh, Scotland. I just was a poster presenter or whatever, a friend of mine at the USDA said, you should present, put, you know, try presenting at this thing. And they said, yes. So I like went and I knew like nothing about like the planetary health world. You know, I was learning about bees. I went to this thing and I was like, oh my gosh, it's depressing. You know, because you're hearing about the slums in Nairobi, the pills that we're putting into the water, the like blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I looked at my friend Tamberly, who I call Tamber B next to me from the US Forest Service at the time. And I was like, this crowd needs a party. You know, <laughs> I was like, they're doing such incredible, hard, heavy work. And I was like, let's rent out a pub. You know, so we rented out a pub and we like showed a movie and we just let people like have a drink and like hang out. 
And so there's like this part of it that I think is really important, you know, to like really be considering that as we're going along because like the, the path, you know, it is audacious. It's a, it's big stuff we have to change. So how are we taking those little, little steps along the way to like connect, you know, and, um, and enjoy saving the world. I mean, it sounds trite, but like, it's true. We can do it however we want to. We can be miserable doing it or we can enjoy it, you know? So kind of my <laughs> answer to that one, I guess. I just will add to that. I think that's, that's something that I know I've found in advocacy is like the quickest way to watch someone glaze over is to be gloom and doom. And you want to give people the information, you want to give people the data, but you also want to give people the hope and the solution. Um, and you know, millennials got such big pockets to carry all our audacity. So we're going to do it and it's going to be great. <laughs> but that leads us to the final question that you really kind of just answered. So it's up to you how you want to do it. But this is for both of you. This is the question that we end every conservation conversations with. And it is, you know, you have an audience here tonight that are generally tapped in, who are like generally pretty into it and kind of understand. And the, the question is, what is maybe the one kind of fundamental message you want people to take or and or the one action item that you hope people will leave here and do? So on one hand, you kind of answered it, Matt, of, of not getting discouraged and of finding your way of doing it. But if you have another one, you can you can answer with it. And then just same question to you. Sure, you want me to go first? OK, I'll go. Um, yeah, the one thing that's popping into my, my mind, because I've got a John here again with a camera on me, like we're literally making this episode of this show as a on a shoestring. Like we are crowdfunding for it. So if you go to thegoodofthehive.com, there's opportunities to like win, you know, entries to a, to win a free painting I'm making in the studio. Like there's, it's just, I say this a lot, like to people who are like, how do I do more? I'm like got four kids and I'm doing this job and whatever, and they've got money, but they don't really have time. And I'm like, find your person and support the crap out of them continuously. Even if it's small amounts, find the person who's out there doing the work or the organization and like continue to help them, you know? But the thing about this show is if we can get it going, it will be a continuing broadening message. You know, that's the idea is to be able to take what happens on my mural sites and bring that out to a bigger audience um, and hopefully be able to create more change. So that would, you know, along with the other answer, <laughs> probably be what my ask would be bravely anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good answer. I, I think my, um, my, my, my take home message um, I think is is that uh, bees are 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 surprisingly um, resilient, and I think there's there's a lot that we can uh, do for them, and e even um, small changes can um, have have a big impact because the you know, bees are are really flexible, and they um, even even in urban areas, um, the the diversity of of pollinators and bees in particular is is surprisingly high it's something you know i learned uh, doing my my graduate research and so you know even even at your local level in your backyard you can do things that help pollinators um and you can um you can do things at a at a um, and, and i i think uh, yeah addressing our, our agriculture is going to be uh um uh, a big challenge going forward especially in how it relates to neonic use, um, we we need to we need to rein in our, our pesticide use, um, and and you can you can do that at the dinner table by uh, by consuming less meat and uh, making different choices about what to, what you're eating. I mean, and and those uh, lowering pesticide use um, is better for bees. That's just that's that's probably my number one thing. I would I would say. That's great. Thank you, Jess and Matt, so much for joining us with Conservation Conversations. And of course, Malia as well, for getting you two to come on with us and also Malia for joining us. 
Um, we have another conservation com conversations coming up in March. It's March 11th. It will be about migratory birds. So join us then. Um, again, if you like all of the work that we're doing, uh, consider, of course, a donation to Matt, uh, the good of the hive. Try to get in um, that uh, print he's doing. Uh, <laughs> try to get on that as well. Uh, sign the petition to help protect the American bumblebee. Put, you know, plant some really nice, healthy native flowering plants in your backyard and don't use pesticides. Also think about sending a donation over to Environment America, Environment Maryland, and Environment Missouri. So thank you again so much for joining Conservation Conversations. And Matt, I really want to advocate for you to come do a mural in Kansas City. <laughs> I know I'm in. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, y'all. Have a good night. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.